So yeah, uh, dear participants and uh, all of you who will be watching this event, greetings. This is Somava Basu, president and founder of the Council for Global Cooperation, CGC. And I would like to warmly welcome you all to our today's session. Our today's session is uh, we are again uh, back with another book discussion. Today's discussion, we would focus on a new book by Professor Samuel Moen entitled Liberalism Against Itself, Cold War Intellectuals and the Making of Our Times. Published by Yale University Press last August, Liberalism Against Itself is one of the CGC endorsed books of this year. Samuel Moen's Liberalism Against Itself provides a thought-provoking perspective on liberalism and the Cold War intellectuals who played a pivotal role in shaping it. Moin conducts a critical examination of Cold War liberalism, contending that its tradition has restricted the scope of liberal imagination and impeded political inspiration. To understand the why, why and how behind his arguments, Today's session offers the most suitable platform for our audience to find answers as we delve deeply into the discourse. And before we start with our today's event and hear the author and discussants lead the discussion, for our viewers, I would like to briefly introduce the author and our today's featured speaker, Samuel Moin. Professor Samuel Moin is Chancellor Kent Professor of Law and History at Yale University. And within our CGC, he is a member of the Board of Governors. He is a scholar working primarily on modern intellectual history with focus on human rights and the law of war. He also specializes in legal and political thought and Jewish studies. He has written several books which, has, uh, which have turned into bestsellers and most discussed, from which I would just name a few. The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, Christian human rights, not enough human rights in an unequal world, and human, how the United States abandoned peace and reinvented war. Uh, apart from his research as a historian and legal scholar, Professor Moin is a frequent commentator on various social and political issues. And uh, I'm sure we will have the opportunity to discuss it with him as well during our discussion. Uh, it is a really great privilege to have you with us today, Professor uh, Sa Samuel Moin, along with our other panelists, Professors Jan Warner Mueller, David Armitage, and Mira Siegelberg, whom I would introduce a little later in our session today. So without further delay, I would like to pass on the floor to the author Samuel Moin for his opening remarks and to provide a brief overview of his recent book, Liberalism Against Itself. Sam, the Zoom floor is yours. Well, thank you so much to you for hosting this session. Uh, I'm very grateful. I'm even more grateful to the commentators, um, friends, and colleagues. Uh, you know, I I will give a, a brief overview of, of the book, but no more than 15 minutes, because I think the the best use of our time together is to just have a an egalitarian discussion and uh you know, I I would rather just uh, be brief. So I will share some slides just that I made up for another purpose, but, uh, you know, they're not that crucial. So th this book, uh, as most people, uh, you know, know, comes from a set of lectures. It's six character portraits, no more, no less. And um, it was really imagined as an intervention into an American debate about liberalism when donald trump was elected in 2016 you know alongside all the other fascinating effects uh, there was a, a referendum on liberalism conducted uh within a short within short order the reactionary author patrick deneen got a lot of attention uh, for his book called Why Liberalism Failed. And this was in at the forefront of kind of, you know, American uh, public debate about what, what Trump signified. Um, and uh, you, you had a, a, a range of responses to Deneen in part because he was so promoted, not just by 
uh, fellow conservatives and reactionaries, but by liberals themselves, like Barack Obama, for capturing some disquieting possibilities about the you know end of liberalism. And most of those uh, responses uh, were were frustrating to me. They they conceded that something was wrong, um, even as Edward Luce, the Financial Times journalist suggested that liberalism, Western liberalism, no less, was in retreat. But most of the responses more or less reversed Deneen's withering verdict and and provided a kind of cautious but uh, but more or less redemptive approach to liberalism, especially when one looked at uh, attempts to do the history of liberalism in these defenses, they they more or less track Deneen's story, which is that liberalism is um, coincides with modernity, so it's you know five centuries old more or less, and is linked to various moral commitments to individualism and freedom, uh, and uh, especially in in the the last of these more defensive tracks, uh, Francis Fukuyama's liberalism and his discontents, um, there was the familiar story that uh, many of us, at least in Western universities, have been exposed to of, of liberalism as the heritage of John Locke and his successors through John Rawls. What, what struck me um, as problematic as as a historian of ideas, uh, as well as a, a, as a political being, was that this debate seemed to clash with what historians, professionals uh, in the field of intellectual history were saying, and politically left out, I think, the, the most important option for liberals today which was to choose between a kind of totalistic rejection and an, a totalistic defense of liberalism to tell a, a, a different kind of story about the trajectory of liberalism, which in turn opens up new possibilities. So professionals had actually not written tons about liberalism until recently. There is an interwar book by Mar then Marxist Harold Lasky and a more favorable book by an Italian uh, translated by a, a, a famous English Don called The History of European Liberalism, but mostly the historiography of liberalism by professional historians has been reserved for our time, and especially in a spate of new books that somehow both Deneen and uh, his respondents, you know, just missed. Uh, and I think it provides a more promising starting point for thinking about the situation of liberalism in our time. So first, I would say the new historiography insists that uh, liberalism is not principally the result of early modern developments, especially not early modern religious wars that led to a strong state sponsoring toleration among sects. Rather, it's a modern phenomenon, especially self-styled, uh, in which liberalism's liberal liberalism receives the heritage of the French Revolution and tries to reclaim it in some institutionally durable way. It's not Anglophone, at least not principally. It's not founded by any Anglophone thinker like John Locke. Uh, not just because it's not that old, but because it's not principally. Anglophone or English. Rather, the first liberals were all in, in Western Europe, Western continental Europe, Spain, France, uh, e even Germany, um, before you get, you know, a, a, a big Anglophone liberalism. And indeed, as in the United States of America, aside from a few people in the Reconstruction, the major uh, birth of of self styled liberals occurs only after World War One, with the founding of the New Republic magazine, and in general, um, kind of changing the timeline, but also the location of the earliest liberalism uh, 
uh, changes our sense of what it's about. Uh, not uh, not a, a tolerationist movement uh, focused on the the role of the state and keeping people safe from fanatics, but then making sure in turn to limit the state for the sake of individual freedom, but uh, rather reclaiming the legacy of the French Revolution uh, for the sake of um, emancipation. Uh, and it was crucial in this new literature, especially if you read, I think, the leading work by Helena Rosenblatt, that uh, early liberals were nearly all affected by the Romantic movement um, uh, in philosophy and literature, which meant that far from being tolerationist, most early liberals, at least as thinkers, uh, folks like uh, Benjamin Constant, Alexis de Tocqueville, John Stuart Mill were perfectionists. They said there was a, a best way to live and liberals brought it on the ruins of uh, older, uh, more authoritarian schemes. Uh, and that best way to live was creative freedom uh, the 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 question that raised raged amongst them was how to institutionalize that. What mix of state and non-state institutions would best make possible a society in which people uh, can make uh, of themselves interesting uh, contributions and and lives for the sake of of collective progress. So. Uh, the basic thesis of this new book, um, which is, again, just a series of character studies, is that in the middle of the 20th century, liberals abandon all of those original commitments after the French Revolution and really let uh, the Soviet Union inherit much of what liberalism had stood for uh, in order to retreat to a much more basic and 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 let's call it fundamentalist position about the risks uh, uh, to freedom uh, in a world uh, which liberals now had to face in a much more disabused or even hopeless uh, way. And I won't, you know, take up any any time to uh, dwell on any of the individuals you see on the slides there, Judith Schlar, Isaiah Berlin, Lionel Trillin, Karl Popper, Gertrude Himmelfarb, Raymond Aron, uh, Yaakov, Jacob Talmon, um, but uh, they, I, I, I basically assert they wrought harm, uh, possibly understandable harm. Uh, they had uh, experienced the dire straits for liberalism, and uh, if one can muster empathy, as I do, you know, occasionally do in the pages of the book, it made sense to register the defeat of expectations and hope precisely for liberal progress in the middle of the 20th century. But not not everyone made those moves. They didn't make them because they were J Jewish, which most Cold War liberals were in spite of the depredations to the Jewish people at this time. And above all, I think they overcorrected um, in light of the it, political experience they uh, you know, suffered or at least witnessed. And, you know, I, I think the, the damage they did is, is in a sense reserved for later and, uh, m maybe is not something they themselves could have anticipated, but I think, uh, you know, is something with which we're living. So just to be very brief, cause I can't, I, I don't want to cover, um, everything in the book, the book's written, um, uh, in allegiance to um, the insight in, in in an earlier author on the slides, Duncan Bell, that traditions work through canonization and recanonization. Bell, I think, I think very impressively showed that John Locke only became a liberal after the fact in the middle of the 20th century as a kind of new construction. Eventually, uh, you know, our construction, our inherited construction of liberalism took hold, which was precisely a kind of libertarian construction, emphasizing rights, property, freedom against an oppressive state. Um, but I, I think Bell neglects a lot of what went on in the middle of the 20th century, because what I try to show in the book is that there was a far bigger reshuffling of liberal tradition at stake. I try to put it in the following way, 
Cold War liberals mainly built what I call an anti-canon, a series of demonized uh, authors and sources that liberals should treat skeptically. Uh, and this actually starts with the Enlightenment uh, and especially uh, one of its its most radioactive thinkers to really all the Cold War liberals, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It proceeds through the French Revolution itself, which, as I said, we, we now understand the origins of liberalism to actually be about reclaiming, and then proceeds to uh, romanticism, that romantic movement that had so affected the first liberals, uh, and let's call it them successors of the French Revolution and Romanticism in the history of uh, political thought, G.W.F. Hegel, and even Karl Marx, whom I, I try to suggest in the book, was long a resource for liberals trying to make their tradition credible until the middle of the 20th century. Um, and uh, with this purgation of all the original sources for a progressive perfectionist liberalism, Cold War liberals substitute some new gurus or sages. One is uh, St. Augustine. Uh, they adopt a, an Augustinian reading of Christianity and, and really embrace Christianity itself for its uh, insistence that we are sinful and we should contain our ambitions, which likely re reflect our depravity, uh, and really should think of politics as about controlling uh, sinful creatures that even liberal moderns will always remain. Now, it's important to note that uh, this it's not as if mid-20th century liberals just become Christian having been secular. I would argue that they had been prior, sometimes secular, but more often Pelagian Christians. And so they're really in the middle of the 20th century, um, moving from one prominent option within Christian tradition to another one, that Augustinian one. But for the secular minded, liberals had sometimes been anti-clerical and not just secular. Um, there was a corresponding new source, psychoanalysis. And I, I deal with uh, Karl Pop, uh, sorry, with uh, Lionel Trilling, the Columbia University literary critic, to narrate how Sigmund Freud, especially the f later Freud, who focused on the uh, you know aggressive uh, death drive, uh, could be a kind of secular surrogate for the Augustinian Christianity, emphasizing our our fallenness. Uh, so what were the results? Well, I, I don't want to, um, you know, go on for too much longer, but I'll just suggest there was a, uh, a, a, a libertarianization in theory of the liberal tradition in which the state became more the problem than the solution to our individual and collective emancipation. I try to show that uh, the great Cold War liberal who maybe uh, wrote the most brilliant encapsulation of its theses in the last year of the Cold War, 1989, when uh, Schlar wrote uh, The Liberalism of Fear, actually began her career critiquing her, uh, you know, her, her former teacher, Isaiah Berlin, for his libertarian understanding of uh, freedom uh, as, as the core liberal value. And, and indeed, she went much further and uh, mainly set her sights on attacking the expulsion of the Enlightenment from uh, the liberal canon, something I just try to build on in the book by showing that there were other expulsions, Romanticism, Hegelianism, even Marxism. Well, let me close by, you know, uh, you know, engaging maybe the more controversial part of the book, which is the suggestion that there's a lot more uh, connection between liberalism as the Cold War liberals redefined it and so-called neoliberalism than, than some liberals would like to acknowledge. And it's it's there's no claim, you know, that I would ever want to make that um that Cold War liberalism was identical to the neoliberalism of a Friedrich Hayek or his many successors. But I would want to suggest that Cold War liberals 
took a giant step towards a an economically libertarian position. If one reads their work, uh, one finds no rejection of it, uh, no defenses built up against it, no endorsement of the welfare states that liberals in their lifetimes were actually building at the height of the egalitarian and redistributive liberal state, uh, not just compared to before, but compared to since. Um, and one finds a lot of similarities, um, above all in the depiction of liberty from the state, especially liberty defined as non-interference uh, from or by that state as the essential uh, liberal value. And then one, you know, must open an inquiry into, well, what's the relevance of, uh, you know, thought to the neoliberal transformation that takes place uh, in a, a few decades after Cold War liberalism was founded, you know, largely in the middle of the 1970s and for the last 50 years. And I don't want to make any crude allegations uh, to suggest that, well, Cold War liberals you know, had they just, you know, defended the welfare state, the welfare state would have survived. Nonetheless, I do think it's very important to reckon with uh, the history of liberal theory and the way in which if you if you think along the lines of, you know, a a a Hegelian uh, kind of interpreter of ideas, um, intellectuals can help capture their age and thought and maybe even at the heart of the cold war liberal state that in practice is is indeed engaging in some institutional renovation there's you know a, a fear about limits and there's a concern about what could happen to the state uh if it uh is it excessively empowered if it interferes too much uh with uh, with so-called private uh, private freedom. Uh, I'll just close by uh, suggesting that maybe, you know, one thing I've, I've been thinking a lot about since finishing the book is, you know, thinking about a kind of double mismatch that this kind of inquiry helps reveal. The first I've been dwelling on that, you know, it, for for a long time, one could read the books of liberalism and not know what they're they're doing in practice. Uh, after the 1970s and our our neoliberal era, we've had a, in a sense a reverse mismatch because it's absolutely true that uh, the Harvard thinker John Rawls corrected the the it, to an extent, not totally, the libertarian biases of. Cold War liberal theory, but it it was it, it, in a way that left him and us hostage to neoliberal practice. And so the point of the book is really to begin to think about, you know, what what the role is of liberal intellectuals in trying to uh in trying to think about how to make their or if you're part of it, our tradition credible. I do think that's been the principal failure of liberal intellectuals in our times, um, partly because of the defensiveness with which they or we have responded to populism uh, and the failure to, in a sense, go back before these mismatches to try to think about what, what resources we have available to not just save liberalism from its dire straits once again, but to make it something that ordinary people would enthusiastically embrace. So I'll stop and uh, look forward to, you know, the discussion. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you, Sam, uh, for a wonderful overview of your stimulating research you have uh, sparked a flood of thoughts for discussion, which we would definitely carry on, carry it on. Uh, before we introduce uh, our distinguished panelists, I would like to inform our uh, participants present that this uh, this is the time when you all can prepare with your questions and everyone can submit their questions as well. Following the commentary, we will have a short discussion session uh, between the author and the discussants. At the same time, uh, we would also have the Q&A and we will do our best to address as many as questions uh, as uh, our time permits. 
So you can uh, send the questions using the Zoom chat box or even by the raise hand function and directly ask to the speakers. So with this, let us now go to our uh, panelists in our today's session. And I would like to start with our first panelist in order, Professor Jan Werner Mueller. Jan Werner Mueller is the Roger Williams Strauss Professor of Social Sciences and Professor of Politics and at Princeton University. He is a scholar who primarily works on political philosophy and the history of political ideas. He is a co-founder of the European College of Liberal Arts in Berlin and the founding director of the project in the history of political thought at Princeton University. He is a frequent commentator on public affairs and politics, and his uh, essays appear in several mainstream publications. He has authored several award-winning monographs that include Another Country, German Intellectuals in Unification and National Identity, What is Populism, and Democracy Rules. It is a great privilege to have you with us, Professor Mueller, and the floor is yours. Well, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for including me. So just to be clear, um, Sam's is an important book that prompts a much overdue discussion of uh, both the character and the legacies of Cold War liberalism. It's also, I think, fair to say, a very polemical book. Um, when Sam said a few minutes ago that there were some moments of empathy for Cold War liberals, I have to say I'm not subtle enough a reader to have sort of caught these, but I take your word for it. Um, it's also, as you also said at the beginning, um, and that's not a criticism, it's, it's also in a certain way a very American book. Um, I think if one had to kind of translate some of the themes or even for the matter of the words, I think one would very soon run into difficulties in terms of uh, making sense of the particular American history um, of the word liberalism, but also more substantive questions about, let's say, the inclusion of social democrats, for instance, in the European context or maybe in other, in other contexts. Now, what I wanted to offer is basically two maybe rather pedantic slash methodological points for discussion, uh, things that Sam and I, as he knows, disagree with. We've been going back in a friendly way about these for many years. And then also, since we have the um, the um, the benefit of having um, Myra and, and David in, in the conversation, I wanted to sort of pose one question specifically about historicism and the nature of history, maybe especially in, in light of David's work on presentism in recent in recent years. So um, the first the first point I would make, um, which, as I as I said, is maybe rather pedantic is about the selection of, of, of characters. Now, obviously, one can always criticize, you know, any portrait gallery for, say, you know, by saying, why isn't so-and-so there, and why did you include that person, and, and so on. Um, my worry has been that um, the particular selection and the particular omissions then allow for a number of generalizations, which I find sort of, in certain ways, don't quite do, do, do justice to Cold War liberalism as a whole. And the person who is most obviously left out, as, as Sam knows, is somebody who was actually on a slide a few minutes ago, namely, namely Remo Aron, who for me in many ways was the quintessential Cold War, Cold War liberal, uh, not the only one, but somebody who definitely would belong in the gallery. And if he were to be in the gallery, then I think some of the generalizations of the book might not work quite as well as they do at the moment. Um, so the points about Zionism, for instance, um, also the point that all oh, these people never sort of really engaged with or argued against uh, neoliberals. I mean, Aron famously um, argued against Hayek. One can find his criticisms maybe insufficient, but it's not that they weren't paying paying attention. And then most of all, um, I think if one included someone like him, but uh, this actually also applies obviously to Berlin and Popper and others, um, I think another theme may have come out more clearly, and that's the theme of value pluralism. Now, I hasten to add that this does not sort of redeem Cold War liberalism. I think if one were to include value pluralism, one could actually maybe tell an even bleaker story about some aspects of this legacy, because um, as many people in this in this call will remember, um, post-89, uh, post 
uh, value pluralism, I think, for some of our contemporaries, becomes a kind of excuse um, for not doing certain things. Because, you know, look, values are always clashing. We can't have it all. Uh, so sorry, you know, equality has to kind of go a little bit or no, maybe sometimes, uh, you know, we maybe have to go a little bit towards torture because, hey, we always have tragic choices. I mean, the kinds of things that maybe some of you remember were at stake in the sort of Berlin commemoration conference at NYU in the late 90s, when basically Dworkin was saying, no, you know, it's sort of it's sort of accepting value pluralism in a certain way is to, as, as Dworkin put it at the time, buying failure in advance. You're already making all these concessions on the basis of these philosophical background assumptions, um, and we don't have to. And then Williams famously sort of argued against that and was trying to show how, in a certain way, making everything too coherent could also exact its its particular political cost. I don't want to go into that. I'm just saying I think that's an important part of the whole story, um, that that sort of isn't really there in the book. And 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 if one brought it in, I think, again, it would not lead to a sort of vindication or redemption of Cold War liberalism, but maybe it would also be a clue to some other problems that we're still, we're still struggling with today. So that's point number one. Point number two um, does relate to the story that, that Sam was also preemptively saying, you know, isn't really in the book, but I kind of think it sort of is. So there are these very strong words about you know, the effects, the results of Cold War liberalism, you know, words like catastrophic, egregious, terrible, uh, fateful, and 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 so on. And obviously, I don't want to make a philistine point that ideas don't matter, or that intellectuals, you know, leave no traces or have no impact, and so on. Um, but in terms of the overall narrative arc, um, I just found it somewhat implausible to say that, oh, if only at a certain moment, which, you know, given, given the logic of the book, must have come before Rawls, um, at a certain point, when neoliberalism was already already kind of creeping in, if only these these figures had defended the welfare state in the right kind of way, uh, we would be living in a different world. And that's not the only claim in the book. And there's there are many many other important claims. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying this kind of invalidates the book in any shape or form. But I found that particular claim uh, in in many ways not very not very not very plausible. And this is the maybe more interesting point. Um, I think it relates to a more general tendency bound up with um, the genre that Sam was flagging also in his introductory remarks. I mean, all the kind of post-2016 um, basically uh, self-flagellation, contrition contributions by, by liberals. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, I think liberals should be self-critical. There's a lot to be criticized. You know, the point is not to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't criticize yourself. Of course not. Um, but what I, at least I find peculiar in a lot of these writings is that as much as people beat themselves up for all their failings, you know, why didn't we go to more Midwestern diners and talk to the, the so-called white working class? I mean, every second New York Times article and op-ed was about this for a while, as, as many of you will remember. Um, all the kind of whole fallout from David Goodhart's incredibly seductive and incredibly misleading uh, dichotomy of somewheres and anywheres. You know, we, we horrible anywheres, you know, why didn't we get rooted again and talk to people, et cetera? Um, what I find so peculiar about this is the background assumption that it's all about liberals. Um, if only liberals acted differently, the world would be different. And I think this sort of systematically underestimates that maybe it isn't always just about about liberals. And I mean, this doesn't apply to Sam, but I think in some of these some of these some of these genres, I, I just find the narcissism incredible in terms of in terms of oh, if only we now thought about this differently. So it makes this gesture of opening yourself up and and kind of paying attention to different experiences, but it doesn't really do that in a serious in a serious way. Anyway, that was my side polemic against the post two thousand sixteen. Um, genre is not so much about about Sam's book. Finally, the kind of question I wanted to pose, maybe for the panel panel as a whole, um, is about meaning in history. So I think it's one of the really interesting claims in the book that um, it's it's a massive problem that, especially but not only Popper, so strongly reacts um, against 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 the Soviet Union. Um, I think Marxism is a different matter. That's another story. You know, I think all these people were sort of, you know, blatantly anti-Marx. Um, but never mind. That, that there's a kind of this this sort of gesture of saying, you know, everything after Hegel is incredibly difficult because you know anybody who tells a story about patterns in in history is basically on the road to the Gulag in one form or another. 
Um, that's not a caricature, I would say. Yes, there were plenty of people who thought like this. Um, Berlin obviously was very worried about uh, about this about this all the time. Um, the, the interesting question that comes out of this discussion for me is, okay, so why exactly do we need these accounts? Rawls obviously thought it was important. And in fact, you know, as time went on, he thought it was more and more important. I mean, this, as many people will remember, you know, the very, for many people, peculiar and surprising elements of Law of Peoples, where he basically says, we gotta, we gotta kind of think through what it means to do political philosophy after Auschwitz and Hiroshima, and where he, in the, in the end, vindicates his own Hegelian approach and says, no, you can still believe in some kind of, in some kind of realistic utopia in the way, in the way I do. And the question I would simply ask is, okay, so what is, what is the meaning of meaning in history? for liberals uh, back then and maybe also today. The crudest answer might be, well, you need some kind of, you need some kind of moral boost. You need to kind of feel that whatever you're doing is worthwhile. Because, you know, if 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 you have too bleak a view, then you know you, you're not going to get out of bed. I mean, this is these this super crude arguments, you know, that are usually made against Adorno and Horkheimer. No, this is too pessimistic, you know, you can't think like this, etc. I'm just curious what other people think about this particular element. And then more particularly, if one thinks we do need accounts like this, what should they really look like today? So if liberals you know, are pressed to say, tell us more about history, what should they ideally be saying? So I'm, I'm curious what Sam thinks about this, but I'd also be very curious to learn more about what Mara and, and, and David would, would say to that. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so, Sam, would you like to uh, answer the question? No, no. I think we should just take all three, and then we'll have a general okay, discussion. Okay. So we will take it all through the day. So, uh, moving to our uh, second uh, commentator, uh, we have uh, Professor David Armitage. Professor David Armitage is Lloyd C. Blankfein, Professor of History at Harvard University. He is a leading historian of intellectual history and international history. His research often focuses on the history of global political thought and the development of key concepts in political theory. He has written extensively on topics such as sovereignty, civil war, uh, and the intellectual history of the Atlantic world. His award-winning publications include The Ideological Origins of the British Empire, The Declaration of Independence, A Global History, and civil wars, uh, uh, history and ideas. So uh, it is a great privilege to have you with us today, Professor Armitage, and the floor is yours. The pleasure and the privilege are all mine, Sumava. Uh, thank you for convening this uh, all-star cast of commentators, and in particular, uh, for allowing us to in engage with an old friend and uh, longtime interlocutor, Sam Moyne, about his latest fantastic book. Uh, an alternative title for Sam's book could be How Not to Win Friends and Influence People. How Not to Win Friends and Influence People in the period after the Second World War if you are uh, a self-questioning but historically well-informed liberal. And uh, in particular, how not to win friends and influence people if you're a very historically well-informed Formed liberal or post-liberal or self-critical liberal of the kind Sam is, uh, among other liberals. I noticed at the very end of the book um, an exasperation which uh, Sam had clearly held in relatively tightly during the body of the book, but that came out in the concluding pages where he talked about fellow contemporary liberals prating uh, about saving liberalism as it was, um, going back to uh, an historical tradition of liberalism before uh, the era of the ways of the Cold War liberals he anatomizes here. Uh, and of course, by uh, speaking of fellow liberals prating about that, uh, Sam is telling us that is not in any sense the way forward somehow to, uh, to sanitize, uh, to apologize for, uh, or at the worst, uh, simply to ignore uh, the heritage of the cast of Cold War liberals he's assembled for us in the book. Uh, I, I would uh, turn around uh, one, one of Jan's comments and, and say, yes, indeed, there are always questions about who goes into any portrait gallery. Uh, but on a positive side, and speaking primarily as an intellectual historian, uh, one of the great achievements of the book as I saw it was to present uh, figures for serious intellectual 
historical inquiry who have not normally um, had uh, such uh, uh, attention paid to them, particularly Gertrude Himmelfarb and Lionel Trilling. Of course, uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin, Hannah Arendt and others have had uh, not just cottage industries, but multinational industries devoted to their contextualization and and uh, and exegesis, but uh, to to take uh, characters like Himmelfarb and Trilling seriously and to do so within a constellation of other uh, equally serious thinkers uh, is a gift to intellectual history, but one, of course, motivated by Sam's present day, uh, if not in fact presentist uh, concerns to ask uh, what it is that an understanding of uh, history and perhaps some of the wrong terms in history and wrong terms in the use of history and engagement with historicism might be able to do to help us to clear the ground for moving forward into the future. Uh, but also, I think there's a more uh, uh, fundamental point, which uh, Sam doesn't elaborate methodologically here, but runs through mu much of his uh, work, uh, which is uh, a serious intention to history precisely as a resource for thinking in the present uh, and thinking forward uh, into the future. Uh, if Arendt spoke of thinking without banisters, um, Sam, I think, does believe, as most of us on, on this call will also believe, that we do need some banisters or we can be helped uh, up the stairs or uh, along the, the corridors uh, of the, uh, the divigating future by having some guidance from history, not to be um, tied down by that history, not to be uh, walking backwards, always looking to the past, uh, with, uh, with, with our eyes uh, turned towards where we have come from, but rather looking towards the future with some guidance from the past. I think there is um, a methodological commitment to the excavation of history or other multiple histories, and indeed specifically in this book, to the, uh, to the excavation of historicisms um, in their various forms uh, for, in, for inspection, uh, some of which now seem uh, particularly hoary, uh, some of which might be helpful uh, in orienting us towards uh, towards the future. Uh, Sam, I th uh, the, Sam's introduction, I think, was particularly helpful in placing the Cold War liberal movement or moment, if such it was. Uh, we can debate, again, whether this is an unstable coalition, and I'll come back to that in just in just a second, uh, but let's take uh, uh, for, for granted for the moment that he uh, has indeed identified such a Cold War liberal moment and has uh, identified or brought, brought for inspection most, if not all, of the uh, the Cold War liberals uh, many of us might want to see in such in concatenation. I think the original lectures were were six and six alone. A uh, seventh would surely have had to have been about Raymond Aron and there are other characters uh, one might want to propose. But uh, taking this as a particular moment, um, uh, Sam uh, presents this as a moment not only of importance in its own time, uh, but also as a reference point for many uh, current uh, post-liberals, anti-liberals, self-questioning liberals, and, and indeed possibly forward-looking liberals as well. And his overall answer is to say that uh, if we're looking for a forward-looking liberalism in our particular um, tense and fragmented moment, um, this is not the place uh, to be looking for it. And he gives us the very good reasons why we should not be looking for uh, a renewed or a renovated or uh, 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 liberalism uh, uh, to point us towards the future. Uh, and so the, the questions I, I would throw back uh, uh, to Sam, uh, particularly uh, in, in light of the, um, the even more polemical conclusion more polemical than, than the body of the book uh, are three or four. The, the first is, is the simple question of, is liberalism worth saving in any form, uh, at least under this rubric? Um, I certainly recall when I first arrived uh, for a full immersion in the academic life of the US in the late 1980s, uh, having come from the uh, uh, the innocence uh, the, uh, uh, of, of Cambridge, just how obsessed everyone seemed to be with talking about liberalism in all of its various forms and fashions. This was entirely alien language, or almost entirely alien language for for uh, for, for, for a rather naive uh, a little English boy being thrown up on the shores at that point of, of Princeton, New Jersey, uh, to wonder what on earth everyone was indeed prating about at that point. Uh, and I still wonder that, even, even the array of uh, historicist treatments of liberalism post-2016 that uh, Sam begin with, began with, even though it includes 
British figures like uh, Ed Luce and Edmund Fawcett, I think uh, their um, uh, engagements with uh, the past and the potential future of liberalism are just yet another sign of the Americanization of everything in the UK, rather than, as it were, an entirely uh, um, endogenous uh, outgrowth from within from within Britain itself. But it, I, I totally agree with Jan that this seems like a very American book, albeit one delivered uh, uh, in its initial form in the, the highest citadel of, of Englishness uh, uh, in, in, in Oxford itself. Uh, the second question, again, coming back to these questions of presentism and, and uh, historicism, not in the Popperian sense, but in a general sense of uh, going back into the brand tub of history uh, to find resources for moving forward uh, into the future, is uh, will history itself be one of the potential cures going forward? Uh, should we be looking to the past? Obviously, as an historian, I believe passionately and spend most of my waking hours uh, acting on the assumption that the, the treasure trove of history or the, the rubbish heap of history History, the waste paper basket of history is indeed one of the places where we should be looking. But I think I'd like to hear a little bit more explicitly from Sam why he thinks uh, uh, to to uh, to to refurbish a, f a famous phrase of Quentin Skinner's why we shouldn't be doing our thinking for ourselves and why you might need help from historical figures uh, to do that. And if so, uh, who will be in uh, a potential canon uh, of liberalism in the future, uh, a liberalism in, in his own terms, which will be perfectionist, prog progressivist, uh, and universalist, uh, what uh, Sam calls challenging, I think very positively challenging, a liberalism worthy of the name that's immensely Patriarchy, futuristic, uh, and based on the idea of human freedom and equal self-creation and self-perfection, uh, if we're going to create uh, so, um, such a renewed and renovated uh, form of liberalism, who will be in the canon and who might be in the anti-canon? Um, clearly, romanticism is no longer a dragon to be slain, uh, even in English departments, let alone among political theorists. Uh, the uh, Enlightenment has fragmented in so many different directions, it's impossible to see that as a, uh, either part of a canon or anti-canon in any meaningful sense if we, if we cling to the historical treatments of that. Uh, should we indeed, to, uh, to take his phrase, go back behind uh, some of the, the liberalisms we've inherited, particularly in their nominalist forms from the early 19th century? Uh, I would certainly say going back to someone like Wollstonecraft, for instance, uh, the young Marx. Um, these might be places where uh, we begin uh, in the crucible, the fiery matrix uh, of uh, 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 revolutions, uh, American, French, and Haitian. Uh, these might be places, if we're looking for, for historical roots that we might go back to, uh, then to reimagine and perhaps also to burn off some of the, uh, the, uh, the discriminatory and hierarchical aspects aspects of liberalism as they were accreted over the course of the 19th century, most notoriously with Mill Tocqueville and, and others. So, so again, just in closing, I, I would say if history is going to be a resource, I'd like to hear a very brief defense of that kind of historicism from Sam, um, and also uh, perhaps a little more on where we might go in forming a canon and, and thereby necessarily also an anti-canon uh, as resources for uh, this inspiring uh, perfectionist, progressivist, universalist um, uh, uh, liberalism of the future, uh, which uh, he and I, I think, uh, would sign on to. Uh, I, as an adopted American, am quite happy to sign on to this if it will do the necessary work in this particular political media, uh, but I wouldn't be hung up on uh, the very term liberalism. Uh, I, I can hear the, uh, the beating of the wings of the owl of Minerva, not just to tell me my 10 minutes are up, but also that these considerations of liberalism uh, may be intimations of something that we might call post-liberal or we might indeed just uh, abandon the, the labels of liberal and liberalism to think of something new that might come out of uh, the revolutions of our own time, particularly uh, inflected by climate crisis and not simply confined to uh, other purely human uh, aspects of perfectionism and progressivism uh, that uh, might speak in particular uh, to the rising generations of our own time across the world. And with that, uh, I will pass over uh, to Mira with thanks again for uh, uh, to Samava for convening this uh, wonderful discussion and to Sam uh, for the gift of this uh, provocative and profound book. Thank you, Professor. And uh... I'm sure uh, we will uh, come to the uh, answer to these questions uh, during the discussion hour. Uh, so moving to our uh, third panelist, uh, which is Professor Mira uh, Siegelberg. Uh, professor Mira Siegelberg is University Associate Professor in the History of International Political Thought at 
a Cambridge University. She received her PhD in international history at Harvard University. Her research focuses on the intellectual and legal history of international order and the history of modern legal thought. Her first book titled Statelessness, a uh, Modern History was, was published in 2020 and has received multiple awards, including the 2022 Francis Book Wickardini Prize for Best Book and the 2023 Laura Shannon Prize in European Studies. Uh, her current project involves reevaluating the formation of modern international and political order by examining the historical interplay between corporate and nat natural persons in legal and moral thought. It is a great privilege to have you with us, Professor Sejelberg. The floor is yours. Um, well, thank you so much, Sumava, for the introduction and for inviting me to take part in, in this panel. Um, it's it's really a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk about Sam's book um, with Sam and with this wonderful panel. Um, I've been thinking about the the arguments and the themes for a number of years, so it's it's great to be able to to reflect a bit more today. Um, and I think my my comments build in some way and respond, um, especially to to Jan's final final question. Um, but in 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 the vein that that David was uh, thinking about, I think I would describe the book. Maybe Sam would say it differently. That it has a genealogical thrust, as many of Sam's books do. Um, genealogy deployed here in the service of explaining a neglected dimension of the transformation of liberalism in the mid twentieth century. The book is evaluating the legacy of a specific group of intellectuals. Um, a group that many of whom, maybe not Gertrude Himmelfar, but that in the extended post-Cold War moment, like Arendt, Berlin, Schlar, Popper, were often held up, at least in the American Academy and by public intellectuals as brave speakers of truth whose work should be mined for their wisdom. And the book does flip the valuation um, rather than an experience of exile or the fact that um, all of the figures are Jewish minorities, that these facts accord them special insight into the nature of politics or the correct course for politics in the future in the context of global war, totalitarianism, the Holocaust, the advent of nuclear weapons. Um, the perspective of each of these thinkers is revealed as much more partial and limited, Eurocentric, ethnocentric, and often missing a big picture of global affairs. Um, the book's also arguing that this group, and we can kind of take up the question of, of effectiveness, which Jan raised, but that they were effective in reconstructing a liberal canon of political thought. They chose to focus on fear of the worst rather than to defend some of the best things that were actually taking place in their own lifetimes. And they rooted out the sources that had previously animated a liberal tradition and moved it in a more perfectionist and hopeful direction. And I'm kind of summarizing um, some of what Sam said about his, his argument. But I think we couldn't just start by, we, we could note that the identity of the group selected here to represent Cold War liberalism does seem to matter for the argument of the book and that they don't only cohere as a result of how they transformed liberalism or what they did with the legacy of the Enlightenment, the book is actively reducing, um, resisting reductionist claims about the meaning of exile or what it means to be a minority. But surely it matters that these are figures who did have a special relationship to the catastrophes of the 20th century and the consequences of the breakdown of a liberal bourgeois European order. And so one implication I think is that if they could have evaluated their world differently, which I think is a key counterfactual that runs through the, the chapters, then surely those of us in the present can think about our world in different ways too. And so what I want to press on, and maybe this is the crudest terms possible to address a book, especially for a historian, is to think about the more psychological conditions for transcending the legacies of Cold War liberalism and, and maybe it's not really fair to think about the book in these terms at all, but it is it is the, the theme that 
that I kept returning to when, when I heard the lectures and, and when I read the book. Now, one point of the genealogy is instrumental and practical. So the version of liberalism that this group put forward and they and their fellow travelers created by cutting liberalism off from its tap roots of enlightenment, romanticism, historicism, it's just that it's not sufficiently, I mean, one of the claims is that it's not sufficiently appealing <laughs> to create a powerful coalition that could ensure the survival of liberalism in general. It's just not working as a strategy for defending liberal values. So that's a, a realist claim. And so the book is hinting at this practical problem of what it would mean to build um, a powerful coalition of progressive voters. And Sam's written elsewhere about um, what it would take to overturn um, judicial constraints in the United States such that an imagined majority could achieve such goals. And so one suggestion is that bringing the world closer to utopia is in the service of real politics, the real politics of creating constituencies and coalitions and a broad voting public. Okay, but the final, and I would say the most powerful chapter in the book deals with the, the literary critic Lionel Trilling. And it does raise the specter of the psychological dimensions of Cold War liberalism. And I think it does hint at the question of what kind of moral psychology or disposition would be required to supersede it. And so rather than focusing on the, the historical claims that make up the genealogical history, which of course we, we could just, we could absolutely discuss, I'm happy to talk about Arendt and, and Berlin and Schlar, but actually what I'm really interested in is, is asking Sam about whether there is a moral psychology or disposition that subjects who could cast off the constraints of the Cold War le legacy would need to, to discipline themselves to achieve. So besides idol smashing, which is part of what the book is doing, what is the book suggesting about the mental conditions necessary to return to a more hopeful, progressive, future-oriented version of liberalism? And I'll, I'll, I'll say something about what I think this, you know, what that would look like at the level of, the, of a canon, which, which David was asking about. But it seems to me that there is more at, at stake. I mean, there's, there's both what we read, but also how we kind of orient our minds. And so in this wonderful chapter on Trilling, we see how Cold War liberalism involves constraints on the liberal imagination. But we also get a sense of some of the illusions and the fantasies that were involved in Trilling's prescription for self-protection. Even Trilling himself, the, the chapter argues, suspected that embracing the tragic dimensions of human existence, its contingencies, its uncertainties, its ambiguities, wasn't necessarily the mark of a more serious and mature mind willing to face up to the harsh truths of reality, or at least doing so comes at a severe cost. And I think that that last chapter is asking us to evaluate um, whether the psychic self-discipline that Trilling imposed on himself to resist his youthful, hopeful expectations for a more just wor world, even works as a kind of self-protection, both at the level of individual psychology and that of collective national politics. So one possibility that the book suggests is liberation from these self-imposed bonds, historical, but also psychic bonds. And Sam writes that whether liberalism deserves to survive depends entirely on whether it can recover what Trilling preserved from the controls that he mistakenly placed on it. But my question is whether the renovation of liberalism, whether it does depend simply on becoming free from those constraints. It, I mean, I think the book is also suggesting that we might need a different kind of psychic monitoring. And borrowing from, from Jan's book on the study of Cold War liberalism, where Cold War liberals are described as having devised strategies that depended both on particular accounts of history and a kind of moral psychology, is the book suggesting that these liberals of the future will need, I mean, this is, you know, David already pointed at this, alternative histories, but also a different moral psychology. And I would, I mean, I, I would venture that one of these alternative mental states um, can be found at, at one point in the book when Sam writes that um, 
I'm quoting that exaggerating risks leads to overreaction, even as other threats are minimized or missed. Longstanding problems fester that exacerbate the challenges prompting overreaction in the first place. And so this prescription to resist the impulse to exaggerate risk, I think resonates, maybe in, you know, it's a bit funny, with a recommendation that we find in some of the writings of Michel Montaigne <laughs> um, for how to both calm the individual psyche, um, but also the, the collective psyche. Now, Montaigne is, of course, usually enlisted to support the liberalism of fear. He's an example of the, the neo-Stoic response to civil catastrophe and religious war. But in his essays, um, especially the one on on learning how to die, but in and his his attempts at self-portraiture, Montaigne writes that it's not just that it's unpleasant to fear death, but that this fear generated by an active imagination that projects itself into the future can actually produce more extreme reactions and violent behavior. Um, worrying about death can can have the alternative result. Um, and in this great book on, on Montaigne by Sarah Bakewell, she talks about how um, he's offering a prescription not just for calming the soul, but but also a, a prescription for kind of dealing with, with civil strife. It's not just a strategy for, for a more pleasant existence. And I think this resonates with this idea that Sam introduces that focusing on certain risks, which you do find um, as a tendency across the, the group that's discussed in the book, um, and that reappears in the acolytes um, in, in, uh, of the Cold War liberal is itself a very risky proposition. It's, it's, it's posed as a kind of self-defense, but actually it introduces more risk. So what are some of the ways that we can work on the self to avoid overreaction? <laughs> um, and how do we know when something actually is an overreaction? And I think one answer the book seems to be supplying is that focusing less on perceived threats to ultimate values and core institutions and more on the practicalities of achieving something better than the social and political arrangements that we currently have is one, I mean, it's a, it's a strategy both at a collective level, but also at the level of kind of disciplining um, the self. But of course, the, the psychological difficulty of what, of, of this proposition should also be acknowledged. This is a a demanding moral psychology, not just a liberation from prior constraint. Um, Trilling presents his harsh self-discipline as a kind of punishing control, but that doesn't explain what's made those who've been canonized as realists or Cold War liberals from Freud to Schlar so appealing, um, so enjoyable to read. You know, why is it more fun to read St. Augustine than, <laughs> than a Pelagian philosopher? Um, survivalism and self-protection function as kind of comforting philosophies rather than difficult and bracing ones. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that my own intuitions stand for the constituencies, the youth that are imagined on the edges of this book. I'm more in the middle than at the beginning, I hope. Um, those who can kind of renovate the liberalism, but, but given what seems to be the state of the world and the impossibility, and this is, you know, David was already hinting at this, that seems to be impossible to think about progress in the future in the same way as 19th century liberals did, given the facts of climate change, we can't depend on unlimited economic growth. Um, it would seem all the more necessary to devise mental strategies that prevent nihilism and despair and hold back an impulse to stand guard, to just maintain a status quo or to tend to value pluralism, as Jan mentioned. How do you maintain a firm focus on the facts that are in the service of one's vision for a more progressive world? So maybe it's it's actually more about, as, as David was suggesting, getting a liberal canon right. And, and we could, you know, we could imagine what, what that canon looks like. It's a it's a new syllabus that has German idealists on it, Hegel, Young Hegelians, Marx, Mazzini. Uh, later 19th century, early 20th century neo-Hegelians and reintegrating those like Weber and Freud back into a liberal canon as defenders of enlightenment rather than its most potent critics. But I still think you need an account of the kind of mental disposition required to focus on the right set of facts um, and to present and authorize a particular perspective and attitude towards the future. <laughs> 
Now, the the final question, I think this also touches on on what Jan was asking about whether liberal theory matters at all or how important liberals really are. But but just to reframe it in terms of Sam's work on on social theory and the question of, you know, is it should we be focusing on subjective attitude at all as mattering um, for the present and the future and how that shapes history? Um, but if I'm right, that there is a theme of moral psychology that hovers around the book, then I think it is worth thinking about the implicit claims about the right mental attitude required or that would be required to move liberalism in a more emancipatory and therefore more practical direction as a way of, of, of getting at some of the, the book's ambitions. Um, so I'll leave it there because I'm, I'm anxious to hear what Sam has to say about all this and to get into discussion. But uh, thanks so much again for including me. Uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, so we would uh, now go to Sam uh, for his answers. And uh, I would also like to mention that we have got, uh, got a few questions and we would uh, like ask them during this discussion hour. And yeah, so over to you, Sam. Yeah. All right. Well, that was wonderful. Uh, and I'm so grateful to all three panelists. Um, I, I guess I'll just run through some thoughts about the major points they made. And if I miss any, they can reemphasize them or we can transition to questions. Um, you know, I'll just begin by saying the book, especially the introduction is harsh, but you, you, you know, you, you had to be there in the nineties uh, when the 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 phenomenon I'm talking about was treated in the most uncritical terms uh, and offered as kind of having gotten essentially everything right at a, at I think at a pivotal time when we can now see that liberalism went wrong. Uh, and so I I I I, I want to cop to kind of overreacting myself to my experience. Uh, which I think is also Jan's of of living through this period of the canonization of some of the figures that I deal with. That said, th there's intended to be empathy in the sense that you know Judas Schlar is treated you know in in the most favorable terms. Uh, Isaiah Berlin, I it, it's generally a, a positive treatment for how exceptional he was in his. Um, laudatory attitude towards the romantic movement. It's true that some of the others I find um, more debatable, but as Mira suggested so brilliantly, Lionel Trilling is really the hero of, of the book, if Schlar isn't. And uh, all throughout, there's intended to be, you know, complication and nuance. I take seriously Jan's point uh, that there's, you know, a selection effect. I mean, it's inevitable. Uh, I don't think Raymond is that interesting anyway. Uh, you know, Ian on the call has written a great book about him. And I I didn't, I, I'm sure Jan's right that one would find a, a, an, a, an explicit criticism uh, of neoliberalism at the heart of Cold War liberalism if one included an, an extra, you know, character or two. But I'm not sure that the general verdict would change. Um, on... On um, on value pluralism, I mean, I try to, you know, be faithful to the chronology of Berlin's texts and the kind of, in a sense, belatedness of that core claim, both in his own work and in his reception and 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 suggest that in in, in the kind of foundational moment of his work, he was interested in a, a, a romantic movement that that initially suggests that defensible pluralism is rooted in a, you know, if you like, commitment to the importance of subjective uh, self-creation, which then gets attached, I think, later, not just to the various things one might do with that, but with, you know, cultures and so forth, um, nations, as his, his work unfolded. I also you know, cop entirely to Jan's reservations about claims to effect. I, 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 in the end, I think it's, it's a mistake to think counterfactually about, you know, 
what what would have happened had intellectuals given more persuasive arguments. I think one can ask maybe more generously about this kind of account. Well, what what are what are the costs of having a culture that is not clear about its its it its own practices and uh you know intellectuals are are in a sense symptomatic of something much broader uh and those of us who study intellectuals as guides to the spirit of their age are 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 you know shouldn't then be you know I, I guess push too hard on tracing exact effects because we all know that you know the 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 way in which you know Freud defines the the culture of his time is is if is you know uh, like you know transformative in all sorts of ways that are very hard to assess and measure. Still, of course, one wants to um, make you know credible arguments about you know, the exact role of ideas relative to practices. I'm sure it's true that neoliberalism emerged out of, you know, let's call it welfarist liberalism for reasons that were internal to the attempt to make welfare liberalism work and not principally, you know, due to the failure of Cold War liberals to defend that uh, project. Nonetheless, I think you know, one wouldn't want to read them out of the story entirely. I think the really pressing questions you all have raised are about history and and philosophy of history. And I would distinguish these two. Um, you know, historians aren't trained to be philosophers of history. And yet, I think we need such uh, a transdisciplinary kind of project to retrieve the very idea of a philosophy of history from some of the strictures that uh, Cold War liberals uh, placed on it, and historians could contribute, but it would have to be something that would involve saving the discipline of philosophy as currently practiced in the Anglophone world, especially. Um, I do think there are resources, including in canonical sources and canonical liberal sources for that kind of project, so let me turn to that. I'm I'm a bit more nervous than David about the idea of post liberalism, just because it's so strongly associated in my paro from my parochial American point of view with re reaction, not uh, you know emancipation on on a an overheated planet. And so I want to dwell as 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 you know intently as I can on what what one could find of value in a re reconstellated liberal canon for the sake of a you know new liberalism or latest version of a new liberalism and i i wouldn't want to dismiss uh in the way david did the enlightenment and romanticism i don't care what's happening to romanticism in english departments i you know i think it's it's of immense importance for the future of liberalism same is true of hegelianism left hegelianism at least uh, and indeed aspects of Marxism from which I would insist that liberals at their best have learned an enormous amount and still must, especially with the revival of self-styled Marxists today. That said, I think we do have an opportunity to globalize the canon of liberal thought. And, you know, a figure I quite admire, like Pankaj Mistra in his book on the in the on the ruins of empire has done that work actually better than professional historians have done with all the obsession about liberalism and imperialism we have just done a very poor job in our time uh thinking about the the global export of liberalism uh among non-white and non-christian audiences in in the way that pankaj does in that book and and some others have done. So I guess I should close with with Mira's just amazing point, which is that this book is about uh, not just canons, but the psyche that would be, you know, interested in constructing them and, and imagining uh, a, a, a new liberalism. And I, I totally, you know, I, I side with her in saying that the most empathic part of this book is the trilling chapter where I try to show that not only did he, like so many others in this era, have a damaged life, and not only did he set up these kind of, kind of uh, you know, um, constraints that he thought would 
diminish risk, but he struggled against those constraints. And in a sense, we can take his case uh, uh, as useful for thinking about a different psyche, especially if we conclude that the very constraints that Cold War liberals placed on uh, policy and the psyche for the cis for the sake of managing risks ha ha have as as Mira so I think you know insightfully put it been risky in their own right uh, and you know part of the 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 spirit of of the suggestion I think would be to go back to you know um, other other mobilizations of psychoanalysis that were not about so so you know, focused on aggression and its consequences and on self-management and response like the like Herbert Marcuse's thought. Uh, and I, I do have a, a short passage about someone in our field, intellectual history, Paul Robinson and Trilling's engagement um, with him. Um, but I, I also, you know, take her point about um, kind of in that spirit, thinking about uh, canonical sources for the management of fear. And since she's talked about Montaigne, let me just mention Tocqueville, who um, I think of as the greatest liberal of all time, not least because he spoke about fear as, you know, an inveterate reader of Montaigne, and especially what he called salutary fear. And the question, uh, as Tocqueville understood it, as I think, uh, in a way, a uh, uh, an anticipatory critic of the Cold War liberals is how to manage fear without letting it consume you and not just, you know, overreact in response, but also neglect opportunities and incur new kinds of risks. And so, you know, Tocqueville's was not a liberalism of fear. It's It was a, a liberalism that took this significance of fear seriously, um, but didn't let it, you know, leave you know, those who experience it prisoner. And I I just want to, you know, suggest that I hope Mira herself works on this. You know, those remarks were uh, publishable. And I think, you know, really, you know, the kind of exactly the kind of thinking I, I wanted this book to lead to because I don't have any answers, but I do completely agree that thinking about a new liberal psyche that is it renegotiates its relation to fear would have to be the first step alongside uh, the recanonization of liberalism and the reclamation of the philosophy of history. So I'll stop there because I know, you know, we have at least 10 minutes worth of questions to go through. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, thank you, professors, for this wonderful uh, discussion and the uh, points that had been raised. So we are about to reach time, and we would uh, limit a, a very uh, limit to very few questions. So, uh, the, there is a question which is in the uh, comment, and uh, this question is by uh, Panos, and uh, this uh, question is to all the panelists actually. Uh, do you believe that we have or going to have a fight between liberalism? and populism in the developed countries? If so, how do you think it will end? Are we going to have a world where liberalism or populism will govern and will impact the status quo? So uh, this is to the all panelists. And I mean, uh, everyone can maybe answer briefly. And then we will uh, maybe uh, have two more questions uh, before we pack up. Yeah. So who would like to go ahead with? Well, I'll just begin by saying I think we need more populism in liberalism. And I think the last years of discourse about populism ha have been part of a Cold War liberal syndrome of of treating it as a kind of antonym of liberalism. Uh, but, you know, the truth is that Bolsonaro lost and Trump lost. And if you don't want Trump to win again, uh, it it's because you know, I think it, you need to present a more credible liberalism with populist characteristics. Uh, now that doesn't mean that there aren't illiberal populisms, and I don't want to, you know, suggest that there's. I have some solution to you know Modi or whomever one want might want to name, but I think the 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 discourse around populism of our day is, I think, a very good 
uh, illustration of Mirror's point about the Cold War liberal psyche and 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 the terrors that it feels when rightly challenged. Maybe I can jump in uh, since yeah. I'm part of the syndrome, yeah, sure. so to speak. Um, <laughs> so I think it obviously depends on what you mean by these terms. And I think in many cases, it's a profoundly unhelpful way of framing uh, political conflict today. Obviously, one problem is that it can easily come out as, OK, here are defenders of elites versus defenders of the people. As, as Sam just pointed out, um, actually, the supposed uh, defenders of the people actually often only speak for minorities and certainly not for the worst for the worst off. Um, in my understanding, for better or for worse, populism is not just sort of vaguely doing something for the people. Uh, it's, in a sense, a problem of our time that because pundits and politicians and God forbid, even academics always tell us that we live in the age of populism, we now slap the P word on all kinds of phenomena for which we actually have much more precise concepts. Uh, be it on the neg negative side, racism, nativism, protectionism, you name it, be it on a different side, social democracy. So if that's what you really mean, why, why do we get dragged into a potentially very misleading way of describing this? And then more specifically, I think because people are now so invested in this dichotomy, uh, exactly um, there can be misunderstandings about some developments where we really are talking about different different phenomena also in, in terms of what Sam is trying to get at with the book. So when just very recently people said, oh, Poland, triumph of liberalism versus populism. Um, many of the parties that, well, they don't even have an official coalition, but many of the parties um, committed to collaborating against the indeed incumbent nationalistic, reactionary, sometimes Catholic integralist uh, government they're not liberals in any in any sense of what what Sam is talking about. Um, I mean, you want to ask them what they what they think about abortion. You want to ask them what they think about the economy. So, in that sense, I think it's 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 seductive to kind of divide up the world with these two with these two words these days. But I think for the most part, it does more harm than good. So, Professor Almitia, yeah, you can. Uh, cannot possibly disagree with 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 those prophylactics against um, uh, the determinism that comes from uh, inexact and heavily freighted terms. Um, perhaps one of the the legacies of Cold War liber of the Cold War is precisely that that bu that binary oppositionism, uh, which we have to get beyond. But certainly, we also have to uh, deconstruct those those terms and replace them with with better ones in in the realm of practical politics. So I uh, I don't find it a helpful opposition, but uh, it is it is an enduring um, and um, uh, uh, too readily uh, handy uh, set set of terms and oppositions uh, for popular uh, public discourse, and uh, it's it's uh, we have therefore two levels of problems. One, how uh, those with greater sophistication, both about practical politics and about the genealogical roots of the ideas behind that practical politics, will treat these matters, and then how they'll be. Popularized um, uh, as either as part of political coalitions or indeed as part of political commentary as well. So we have many many different points on the transmission belt to uh, to pay attention to. And um, historians, as, as Sam's work has shown in particular, um, Jan's hist historicized work also uh, do have a role in 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 that. It's an urgent one, but it's it's not an easy one. I don't I don't feel qualified to to intervene because I haven't been making um, arguments as many have about how to interpret the concept of of populism in relation to liberalism. And there is a vast literature. I think um, I'm I'm subject to the confusion that that Jan and David mentioned of 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 how we're applying these terms and the kind of um, non specificity of the concepts and and but. But there is something about the general way that populism is is applied um, in, in promiscuously that does speak to this question in a way about how to interpret mass politics and mass political movements and how to interpret what people want. I mean, which I guess has always been the question of of, de of democracy and democratic theory. Um, but that is is still at play today. It just feels like the stakes are are really high. Um, that people are making you know, incredibly consequential decisions on a, on a mass scale um, 
And it's unclear. I mean, I've been thinking about just the question of how we interpret those those moves. And populism is one shorthand, but it, although it doesn't actually explain anything, it explains something about what we think of as maybe the power of the masses, but but not about the specifics of explaining what they're what they're thinking or what they're doing or the meaning of of, of the votes. Um, so I think there's there's a question of kind of the categories, liberalism, populism, and what they mean as political concepts, but also just a general problem of, of how to interpret um, a, a ma mass phenomena in general. It's an epistemic problem, um, which, which relates to the, the question of how we, how we think about the present and how we think about moving forward um, and, and how we interpret that present in relation to, because the interpretation actually really matters. Um, so maybe it is about clarifying our, our political concepts so that we can have a better way of understanding the, the meaning of, of, of grassroots political movements. Um, that's, those are, those, th that's my quick thought. Uh, thank you, Professor. And so we have, uh, two mo uh, more questions and I think this is from, uh, Joe's Evanes Fitz. So he mentions that considering the book as an initial step that looks decades back, uh, uh, do you see value in an effort to find a transitional narrative for liberalism? Uh, by this, uh, he means that uh, uh, that moves away from the wars towards hoping for the best with global but not globalist value aspirations, leaving the Cold War behind and thinking of a climate-related concept such as the Anthropocene. Yeah. Sam, would you like to answer? Well, I, I, I'm just going to follow up on what Mira said uh, because I, I, I basically, you know, ag agree with, uh, you know, Jose. I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, part of the point of this book and many others in this vein is that, you know, it's not obvious what liberalism is, and uh, once we figure out what populism is, we still have to have a big debate about what the like alternative forms of liberalism are, including potentially ones that cross over into whatever we decide populism is. Um, for Jose, I yeah, I mean, I'm I'm basically as as some of the speakers suggested, trying to imagine a, a new a new liberalism that reverses some of the terms of. Uh, the Cold War uh, liberal, uh, you know, outlook, which means it would be more optimistic and more not just global, but globalist, uh, retrieving some of the cosmopolitan aspirations of liberalism um, from the past and and imagining them anew. So uh, leave it there. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think we are almost at the end of the session. And uh, so on an ending note, I would just like to ask uh, Sam, uh, so you had uh, written Human in 2021. And uh, within a year, you are back with uh, liberalism against itself. So on an ending note, just tell us, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned to me, you have been working more deeply on the war and uh, the current foreign policy on wars and uh, you also mentioned me that vietnam war has been of current interest to you and we are living in a world at the moment where it is not a peace-led international order and uh, uh, there are many current crises which are not or the wars which are not led by western powers uh, like uh, or us but powers which are totalitarian in nature so uh, what have you thought on this? And uh, honestly, what would be your next project after uh, liberalism against itself? Your views and thoughts, yeah. Well, so uh, I just want to thank you for organizing this and I won't do justice to your question, but I'll, I'll just close by saying I, I'm definitely working on something different, uh, which is on gerontocracy. But, um, you know, when I think about war, I, I think about... Um, the the revival of of cold war liberal uh views at, at, mainly as a result of the ukraine war mm -hmm. um what's maybe been most interesting about the outbreak of war in israel palestine is that the attempt to revive uh a kind of you know uh cold war liberal zionism which i do talk about in the book 
uh, in response to Hamas's, you know, uh, it, you know, horrendous uh, attacks ha- has has not been working. Uh, it's 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 just kind of an interesting fact that uh, the the attempt at kind of a restoration of uh, a kind of bipolar uh, mentality with freedom versus tyranny, um, you know, succeeded uh, in in kind of global public debate, at least in the North uh, after the Ukraine war, though not in the global South. But with the 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 limits of of the Cold War liberal revival are, are I think, pl- playing out to a, a kind of interesting extent um, in just what we've seen in recent days around uh, uh, Israel and Gaza. So no one can predict the future, but it's uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, without, you know, saying anything too concrete. I'll, I think that's a great question and I'll leave my answer there. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, and to all the panelists who joined us. It was a great discussion and, and an indeed interesting project and question you would be working on. So best wishes to you and as well as our other panelists, Professor uh, Mira Sejalberg, David Armitage and Jan Mueller. Uh, we wish everyone best and thank you for this discussion. Thank you.